This is a CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell with Gail King in London for a ceremony today likely to captivate the world. Queen Elizabeth II's funeral likely to be viewed by billions, one of the biggest global audiences, mm -hmm. everyone, everyone tuning in to see this. Captivate oh. is the word, Nora. We've been here and I'm already captivated and it hasn't even started. It's amazing <laughs> to be here in this place at this time. It is, the picture's extraordinary overnight. The palace doing something very special, releasing a brand new portrait of the queen. It was taken for her platinum jubilee just a few months ago and in it she's wearing a brooch given to her by her father for her 18th birthday. It's the front page of all the papers today, and you can yes. see she's smiling so broadly. The longest reigning British monarch is being remembered for her decades of service to this nation and the Commonwealth. And of course, we're already hearing there's now this campaign underway. Yes. They don't want to call her Elizabeth the Great. Nope. They want to call her Elizabeth the Faithful. So we're expecting a day of great emotion, pomp and ceremony. You can see, look at the crowds. It's just extraordinary. Millions gathered here. This funeral will be held at Westminster Abbey just behind us. It's going to begin in just about half an hour and the guests including President Biden and the First Lady have already arrived here and um, I mean this West Westminster Abbey this is a place where all of England's kings and queens mm -hmm. have been coronated since William the, the Conqueror. Conqueror. Yeah, it has a very rich history. I was thinking about that picture that we just showed. A lot of the headlines say in the paper today Nora happy and glorious. That picture was taken in May and she does look happy and glorious. Yeah. I think that's a very lovely way to describe the image that you're seeing right there. Look at that smile. The actual funeral, we should tell you, is expected to last about one hour and in attendance. And this was news this morning. Prince George and Princess Charlotte. George is nine. Princess Charlotte is seven. This will be the first time that we see the Queen's great grandchildren since her death 11 days ago. We should also point out that today is a public holiday here in the UK in honor of the Queen who held a unique and timeless place in so many people's lives. Today will be filled with tributes to an extraordinary reign. The public has been encouraged to participate in a two-minute what are we seeing here arriving now? Yes, of course, that's the royal standard atop, and that is King Charles, Charles. III. And, of course, um, he is waving to the crowds. It's just no, I, extraordinary this morning, yeah. And I was thinking about the family this morning because they've now gone through 10 days of this going from place to place. Everywhere they go, they are greeted this way. But at the end of this ceremony today, the public is being encouraged to participate in a two-minute moment of silence observed around the country at the end of this morning's funeral. Heathrow Airport, that's west of London, will stop all takeoffs and landings during the funeral so there won't be any airplane noise. That's good. The last thing you want to hear is a engine running. <laughs> the country has come together in recognition of the Queen's remarkable, and remarkable is the word, legacy, with sadness, respect, and of course, devotion. We've seen a lot of that. And now we see the new monarch, King Charles III, arriving at Westminster Hall, where he is going to help begin this procession. Big Ben ringing behind us, and you will hear that every minute for the next 96 minutes, I said. Yes, and there he is. There's King Charles III. Oh, as well as the heir to the throne. And there's Prince William. So the two of them in the car together, Nora, I wonder what that conversation was like. It's a big day for them both, actually. An incredible day. I want to bring in Holly Williams, who is with us here and just outside Westminster Abbey. Holly? Good morning, Nora. Good morning, Gaya. Well, for the last few days, we've been seeing hundreds of thousands of people line up to pay their final respects to the Queen as she uh, lay in state in Westminster Hall, uh, ver very close to here. Um, I think that line was massively symbolic. Uh, first of all, um, you, you know, it stretched for 10 miles at its maximum point. Uh, people waited in line for 14 hours 
hours. Uh, more than 400 people were treated by paramedics. More than 40 people were hospitalized. People waited through the night. They waited through the English weather. They lined up along the banks of the Thames River that snakes through central London. It really represented just how loved and respected uh, that petite, softly spoken woman really was. Secondly, I thought it was extraordinary the mix of people who wanted to pay their final respects to the Queen. That included last night President Biden. He didn't have to line up. You get special dispensation uh, when you're the leader of the free world. But also David Beckham was in that queue, famous uh, soccer player. He apparently shared Pringles and donuts with other people who were waiting in line. They came from all walks of life, uh, from all across the country and indeed from all around the world. Thirdly, and I, I don't mean this to be glib, I think that was a reminder of how much people in this, this country really like to line up. It really is a national pastime. British people enjoy queuing, as they say in this country. Um, and Holly, I think just that a it was very Holly, Holly, we're going to have to interrupt for just a second because we've got pictures of pictures of the guest arriving today. Yeah, just Ooh, moments ago, we saw the for the first time uh, Prince George and Princess Charlotte, nine and seven years old. It's the first time we've seen them uh, since their grandmother's death, and they will be walking in the procession. They will help bring in her coffin uh, into Westminster Abbey. These are other members of the royal family as well. Yeah, the young prince and princess will be walking behind their parents directly behind their parents, and then after that, you'll see Harry and Meghan. But I think about these young kids, Nora, for just a second. You know, on the day that it was announced that the Queen died, it was very much their first day of school. Tina Brown is with us, and Tina, we're seeing members of the, the royal family here. Yes. Coming in. Yes, indeed. Uh you know, it's been a momentous week for them, a momentous 10 days. Yes. And for, of course, uh, the little prince, uh, George, and his sister, Charlotte, this is their first real inculcation into the royal training. They've already appeared on the Jubilee balcony, but this is what they are going to remember for the rest of their lives when they walked behind uh, the Queen Elizabeth II's coffin. It's the beginning of their royal moment, in a sense. Did they walk behind Prince Philip that day? Uh, no. They did not? No. I thought I'd heard that they walked behind Prince Philip. But I'm thinking, what a day for them. And they just announced this morning that the, the young prince and princess will be, will be participating. Yes, That was they new did. information. And there was some discussion. Today. I mean, Kate wasn't sure whether she wanted to do that. But the decision has been made that they will, that there's, they're up to it, which I think they are, actually. And the fact that there's the two of them, you know, Charlotte is always there. Although she's the younger, she always seems to be the one who's sort of looking yes. after yes. George. The, 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 the slightly bossy younger sister, it's very appealing, I think. Nothing wrong with that, Tina. I a historian and former BBC um, correspondent, Wesley Kerr. And Wesley, this is the Royal Navy, and the military will play a very large role today. What a profound sense of history there is today. Th thousands of officers involved from all the services. So you're seeing the Royal Navy will, will pull the gun carriage. This is the gun carriage that Queen Victoria travelled on to her funeral, Edward VII. George V, the Queen's father, Mountbatten, the Queen's mother, um, the, the immense history. Um, Winston Churchill? Winston Churchill, which was the last state funeral in 1965 that the Queen attended and Prince Charles attended. Um, so we've seen most of the royal family gather in the Abbey, which is a few short yards from where these scenes are. Here we see the um, beef eaters and the omen of the guard. Um, so shortly, the procession will go the, the, from Parliament. There's, there's, there's the, Queen the, the Queen Consort with the Dean well, arriving, arriving at the Abbey. So that's a few hundred yards from Parliament. And shortly, the procession will leave with His Majesty and members of the family escorting the gun carriage. And all the dignitaries are gathered in this astonishing Westminster Abbey, this, the, where the Queen was crowned, where her parents um, were married. There's, there's Kate, the new Princess of Wales, with her wonderful children, um, who are going to be in the procession, which is an astonishing induction for them into the business of royalty. One day, George himself will be king. Um, so, so just so much history in one place. This Abbey, built in the 1060s, um, 13 kings buried here, four queens, including Elizabeth I, Mary Queen of Scots. But the last actual monarch to be 
have his funeral here was 1760. So this is huge history in the making, a day of days, a day we didn't want to see any of us in Britain, mm -hmm. but, but this is our last chance to, to enshroud this remarkable monarch in our love and to thank her in the first of three religious services that will end with her being entombed with her beloved Philip and her parents and her sister in a you're, vault in Windsor. You're so right. You're so right, Wesley. It is a day of days. We're going to bring in Julian Payne. He's a CBS News royal contributor and former communications director for the former Prince of Wales. Now, of course, he's King Charles. Julian, it's good to have you here. We know that this is another emotional day for the king and the royal family. I think that's right. You saw last night the king issued a statement talking about how deeply touched He'd been by the outpourings of um, sympathy uh, for, from the public across the uh, UK when he's visited, of course, not just England, but Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales as well. Uh, and he said how touched he was in this, in this, time, of, in this time of grief. You know, it, it's been a very long uh, period of time for, for them since the death of his mother. Um, but I'm sure that he and the rest of the family have been really comforted um, by the um, response that they've had from the public during this time. And of course, I think for him, he's been reassured um, that, that people have been uh, so quick to take him to their hearts as, as the new king. That seamless transition of monarchy once again seems to be happening before our eyes. Julian, there does seem to be a, a, a lot of goodwill towards King Charles. I'm still getting used to saying King Charles. Here, and here comes the, the here comes Queen Elizabeth II, the car. What is so moving about this is it's really the last time we get to wrap Elizabeth in the splendor of the nation's pageantry. You know, this is the last time. Mm -hmm. It's a thousand years of British history, its whole weight on the move. And the imperial state crown made for Queen Victoria, not the one she was crowned with, but one of two that she wore on that day, um, with the orb and scepter symbolizing a relationship with God and also power. And the, the pearls on the imperial state crown belong to Elizabeth I, so what an incredible link with history. And the royal standard. So it, 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 there's a very powerful religious element in this. Um, and also a military element, you know, the ceremonial wrapping Elizabeth in glory on her last journey. But I'm always so touched, though, by the, the care and the precision that is taken in this moment. And I look at these six, these six men, these six pallbearers, and I'm wondering, who gets that job, Wesley? Who gets well, to do that? they're Her Majesty's guards, the Grenadier guards, and I imagine, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure there would be like a competition. They would probably have to be like the best. Yes. the best of their year, and they will remember this for the rest of their lives, and what an mm. incredible honour this is. Mm -hmm. And the, the tenderness about the way they, yes. they do it, a kind of a humble tenderness, it's a beautiful thing to see. And she became Royal Colonel of the Grenadier Guards as long ago as 1942, on her 16th birthday, um, you know, her first military um, command and in the middle of the Second World War, not an active command, but a really important symbolic position. This has been a central thread of her life, as has religion and service. And just to describe what's happening right now, this is just outside Westminster Hall, where the Queen mm -hmm. has lied in state for four days and been viewed by, I bet it's going to be more than a million people by I the end of the so day too. when we learn. And they are placing her coffin on this catafalque and then the state gun carriage. It's actually 2.8 ton carriage, which will then be pulled by the Royal Navy. Um, this will be... Uh, the, the tradition involved in this, because of course, this has they have been using these same ropes since Queen Victoria's funeral in yes. 1901. Yes, in 1901, you're going to tell the story that um, it, the horses were cold. It was it was <laughs> it was January, I think, at Windsor, and there was a worry that you know, that something would go wrong, that they would bolt so quickly. Um, a young Battenberg, who actually turns out to be Prince Philip's um, grandfather. Um, said, why don't you use the sailors? So that's become the tradition. That, that's very typical of Britain, that something goes wrong and it becomes the tradition. And given that, <laughs> and that it started in February, 
Tina, I was watching the BBC this morning, and they were interviewing some women who are now part of the Royal Navy and will be the first women who have ever been involved in this tradition. Yes, it, it is a wonderful moment that women are being involved for the first time. And, of course, the Queen herself was so tremendously connected to the military. You know, she, she came from a military family. Her whole, fa her whole family has served. You know, her father, her grandfather, her children. She and she served herself in and uniform. And she served herself. In, in the ATS, she, she learned how to, how to strip an engine and, and drive a Land Rover, and that was very bonding experience. So the idea that we still had a head of state until two weeks ago who had served in the Second World War, her husband also was a distinguished, distinguished sailor. So this is the end of an era, an era when Britain had great imperial pomp and its, its role has changed, and she has presided over that change. But, yeah, but the, the military, all of these people there, none of them um, just decorative. All of these people serve. And, and everybody has a role to play here. No one, there is no one who is not supposed to be there. I'm, I just marvel at the precision of the of everybody use, moving in unison. And the, the procession starts now. It will take, I think, 16 minutes um, to go from the Palace of Westminster this, across the historic. West uh, Parliament Square to the Great West or Westminster Abbey, where it will be received by the dean, and the service will begin. Wesley, they have done rehearsals. They had to shut down the line this morning because they were going to rehearse for 45 minutes. The queue officially stopped at 6:30, but they shut down for rehearsal. They really have this time to a T, don't they? Oh, to be honest, this has been rehearsed for decades. Yeah. Um, but they've often had to rehearse at night. So here we see His Majesty leading his sister, his brothers, his sons. Um, Peter Phillips is another grandson of Her Majesty. Um, the, 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 the king's... The, the old queen's staff and the new king's staff. Princess Anne and Andrew. And I love the, Lord, way the Earl of Snowden, who's, who's um, her beloved nephew, Margaret's son. I love the way Princess Anne is the only woman in this group. Uh, she often said that being a member of the royal family, for a woman, you were an honorary man. And you've seen her throughout in her military garb because she's a patron uh, of so many military uh, orders. Tina, I've loved reading so much about uh, Princess Anne, who is known as the royal princess. She was with her mother when she passed. She escorted her coffin back to London from Balmoral. She's been described as the hardest working royal. Apparently, someone that even does more engagement sometimes, even than the now king. And sometimes she's, sometimes she's been known as the best king we never had because you know <laughs> she has the duty gene, just like the queen. But yeah. to pick up on what Nora said, I too read that she's the hardest working royal. But we don't seem to know as much about her as we do her brothers. Why is that? Because she doesn't care about publicity. In fact, she has to be reminded uh, to pose for the press. She she doesn't want it. She just. Works. Wants she to do has the, job. the duty gene. I heard somebody in the royal family once said, We all love hospitals <laughs> <That's right. laughs> because they spend a lot of time they going do. to events at hospitals. And Wesley, we should describe who we're hearing from now. Well, it, it's uh, marvelous Scottish pipers. Um, you know, how appropriate. Um, and she had a personal piper who would play outside her window every single morning, wherever she was. And we will hear him later um, giving a lament at the end of this service and also at Windsor. So when the king will have a personal piper, it's a, to, to be here and hear that coming towards us as we are outside the abbey and hear, hear the sounds of this procession approaching us, that's so emotionally powerful. Well, just as you said that, there was a quick shot of King Charles who seemed very emotionally moved. Um, he's not been afraid to show his emotion this last 10 days. And in that sense, he's going to be a very different monarch to the Queen, whose whole life was about an inscrutable face. We're going to go now to Mark Phillips, who has covered the royal family for years. Where exactly are you, Mark, right now? I'm in front of Buckingham Palace, which will feature later in this uh, very long day of, of ceremony. But when you're looking at these glorious state pictures of a, of a national event, they're really melding together a, a ceremony for three audiences here and trying to satisfy all of them. And it's, it's a very good time to talk about one, because first and foremost, that is often forgotten is that this is the royal family compelled by tradition to mourn and bury its matriarch under the glare of the country and the world's 
spotlight. Millions of people around the world watching this. It's often said the royals aren't like you and me, but there's a test to hear that they're having to go through. The other audience, of course, is the hundreds of thousands of people, maybe a million, who have felt enough of a personal connection to come out and spend as long as 24 hours at one point to queuing up, as Holly would say, lining up patiently over cold nights to pay respects to the Queen as she lay in state. Oddly, the people who spent those long cold nights filing aren't the ones you'd normally expect. Normally, you expect kind of die-hard royals, people who come out for births and marriages, dress up at the Union Jack and that sort of thing. But there was some polling of the people who were who were in these long lines uh, waiting to see the Queen and it showed that they were a much broader group uh, than the normal royal um, royalists who come out for this sort of thing. Mark. Uh, and they were here to witness history and to be part of it. Yep. And Mark, the Queen and the entire procession what I find arriving just outside here of Westminster I'm Abbey. Terribly moving about. This is her last state occasion for us. If she could have chosen for herself, she would have probably had a funeral as simple as Prince Philip's. But this is the big state funeral for the monarch, her last act for us. I think we should pause and listen.
and this, the very solemn moment as the Queen's coffin is prepared to be brought inside the west door here of Westminster Abbey. Wesley, even this was done with such high, pre high precision as they were calling out instructions exactly how to remove the casket and where to place it exactly. And everything is, is done to the last detail, even, even the foliage, rosemary for remembrance, myrtle, the symbol of a happy marriage, um, cut from a sprig of myrtle, grown from Her Majesty's wedding bouquet, and the, they're from royal gardens, and of course the coffin, English oak. So everything is planned to the nth detail, and she would have seen the plans. And, and Tina, we should say that Queen was very involved in planning this, was she not? Very I was, much. I was reading in, in the paper this morning, the local paper, where they said she said she did not want a long and boring service. No, she was all about short, the Queen. And in fact, you know, of course she was a woman of simple piety herself, and that's what you're going to see in the service. But there is something about the fragile delicacy of this military ballet. It's so beautiful to see. Um, I can't help but thinking about not only what everyone in the United Kingdom is thinking right now in her family, this moment when she's brought inside Westminster Abbey, the place where she was crowned, where she was wed. This is a place of enormous significance. It's cathartic, and she once said that nobody should leave a Christian service feeling sad. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's grieving, but there's thanksgiving and there's hope because she really did believe in life eternal, that she would be reunited with her Philip. Um, so so, so yeah, this is a service that she will have planned and she'll have been to services for other family members. This, this was such a devout person. This is the supreme governor of the Church of England for 70 years, the defender of the faith on, on her last but it's so much more than being re reunited with Philip. It's her mother, it's her sister, it's her grandmother. And her and, father. And at the and end of the day, you know, with all the pomp and circumstances, beautiful as it is, we're still more, this is a family who is mourning a great loss. And, but, but they will get great comfort from this. They all yes. know this church and they've all been at, and when we see the service in, in, in the choir, it's amazingly intimate. I've often been to services there with the royal family mm -hmm. and all these events, so they're beneath the place where she was crowned, you will see the incredible mosaic, the Cosmati pavement, 13th century, and in the middle of that, which represents um, the, the, the heavens, it, it's a cosmological symbol, that's where she was crowned, and her funeral will take place yards from that, in the same place she was married. So there's a sense of completion. The funeral service is beginning now, and as the Queen's coffin enters, she would be followed by members of her immediate family, the royal family. Let's listen in.
in grief and also in, <clears throat> in profound thanksgiving, we come to this house of God, to a place of prayer, to a church where remembrance and hope are sacred duties. Here, where Queen Elizabeth was married and crowned, we gather from across the nation, from the Commonwealth and from the nations of the world to mourn our loss, to remember her long life of selfless service and ensure confidence to commit her to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. With gratitude, we remember her unswerving commitment to a high calling over so many years as Queen and Head of the Commonwealth. With admiration, we recall her lifelong sense of duty and dedication to her people. With thanksgiving, we praise God for her constant example of Christian faith and devotion. With affection, we recall her love for her family and her commitment to the causes she held dear. Now, in silence, let us in our hearts and minds recall our many reasons for thanksgiving. Pray for all members of her family and commend Queen Elizabeth to the care and keeping of Almighty God. O oh, merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, in whom whosoever believeth shall live, though he die, and whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall not die eternally, who has taught us by his holy apostle St. Paul not to be sorry as men without hope for them that sleep in him, we meekly beseech thee, O Father, to raise us from the death of sin unto the life of righteousness, that when we shall depart this life, we may rest in him, as our hope is, this our sister doth, and that at the general resurrection in the last day, we may be found acceptable in thy sight, and receive that blessing which thy well-beloved Son shall then pronounce to all that love and fear thee, saying, Come, ye blessed children of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Grant this, we beseech thee, O merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Redeemer.
Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For this corruptible must put on in corruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on in corruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Thanks be to God. Come, Holy Spirit, 
and fill our hearts with the balm of your healing love. Amen. The pattern for many leaders is to be exalted in life and forgotten after death. The pattern for all who serve God, famous or obscure, respected or ignored, is that death is the door to glory. Her late majesty famously declared on a 21st birthday broadcast that her whole life would be dedicated to serving the nation and commonwealth. Rarely has such a promise been so well kept. Few leaders receive the outpouring of love that we have seen. Jesus who in our reading does not tell his disciples how to follow, but who to follow, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Her late majesty's example was not set through her position or her ambition but through whom she followed. I know His Majesty shares the same faith and hope in Jesus Christ as His mother, the same sense of service and duty. In 1953, the Queen began her coronation with silent prayer, just there, at the high altar, her allegiance to God was given before any person gave allegiance to her. Her service to so many people in this nation, the Commonwealth and the world, had its foundation in her following Christ, God himself, who said that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. People of loving service are rare in any walk of life. Leaders of loving service are still rarer. But in all cases, those who serve will be loved and remembered when those who cling to power and privileges are long forgotten. The grief of this day, felt not only by the late Queen's family, but all round the nation, the Commonwealth and the world, arises from her abundant life and loving service, now gone from us. She was joyful present to so many, touching a multitude of lives. And we pray today especially for all her family, grieving as every family at a funeral, including so many families around the world who have themselves lost someone recently. But in this family's case, doing so in the brightest spotlight, May God heal their sorrow. May the gap left in their lives be marked with memories of joy and life. Her late majesty's broadcast during COVID lockdown ended with, we will meet again. Words of hope from a song of Vera Lynn. Christian hope means certain expectation of something not yet seen. Christ rose from the dead and offers life to all, abundant life now 
and life with God in eternity. As the Christmas carol says, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. We will all face the merciful judgment of God. We can all share the Queen's hope, which in life and death inspired her servant leadership. Service in life, hope in death. All who follow the Queen's example and inspiration of trust and faith in God can with her say, we will meet again. In confidence and trust, let us pray to the Father. 
Let us give thanks to God for Queen Elizabeth's long life and reign, recalling with gratitude her gifts of wisdom, diligence and service. O God, from whom cometh everything that is upright and true, accept our thanks for the gifts of heart and mind that thou didst bestow upon thy daughter Elizabeth, and which she showed forth among us in her words and deeds. And grant that we may have grace to live our lives in accordance with thy will, to seek the good of others, and to remain faithful servants unto our lives' end. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Confident in God's love and compassion, let us pray for all those whose hearts are heavy with grief and sorrow. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray thee, with those who mourn, that casting every care on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Amen. Let us pray for His Majesty the King and all the royal family, that they may know the sustaining power of God's love and the prayerful fellowship of God's people. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless our most gracious Sovereign Lord, King Charles, Camilla, the Queen Consort, William, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family. Endure them with thy Holy Spirit, enrich them with thy heavenly grace, prosper them with all happiness, and bring them to thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In recognition of Queen Elizabeth's service to this United Kingdom, let us rejoice in her unstinting devotion to duty, her compassion for her subjects, and her counsel to her ministers. And we pray for the continued health and prosperity of this nation. Almighty God, whose will it is that all thy children should serve thee in serving one another. Look with love, we pray thee, on this nation. Grant to its citizens grace to work together with honest and faithful hearts, each caring for the good of all, that seeking first thy kingdom and its righteousness, they may possess all things needful for their daily sustenance and the common good. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us give thanks for Queen Elizabeth's commitment to the Commonwealth throughout her reign, for her service and dedication to its people, and for the rich bonds of unity and mutual support she sustained. O almighty and everlasting God, hear our prayer for the Commonwealth and grant it the guidance of thy wisdom. Inspire those in authority that they may promote justice and the common good. Give to all its citizens the spirit of mutual honour and respect, and grant to us all grace to strive 
for the establishment of righteousness and peace, for the honor of thy name. Amen. We give thanks to God for Queen Elizabeth's loyalty to the faith she inherited through her baptism and confirmation and affirmed at her coronation, for her unswerving devotion to the gospel and for her steadfast service as Supreme Governor of the Church of England. Lord, we beseech thee to keep thy household, the Church, in continual godliness, that through thy protection she may be free from all adversities and devoutly given to serve thee in all good works, to the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray that we may be given grace to live as those who believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to eternal life. Bring us, O Lord God, at our last awakening, into the house and gate of heaven, to enter into that gate and dwell in that house where there shall be no darkness nor dazzling, but one equal light, no noise nor silence, but one equal music, no fears nor hopes, but one equal possession, no ends nor beginnings, but one equal eternity in the habitation of thy glory and dominion, world without end. In confidence and hope, let us pray to the Father in the words our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
let us commend to the mercy of God our Maker and Redeemer, the soul of Elizabeth, our late Queen. Heavenly Father, King of kings, Lord and giver of life, who of thy grace in creation didst form mankind in thine own image, and in thy great love offerest us life eternal in Christ Jesus, claiming the promises of thy most blessed Son, we entrust the soul of Elizabeth, our sister here departed, to thy merciful keeping, in sure and so certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, when Christ shall be all in all, who died and rose again to save us, and now liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit in glory for ever. Amen. Go forth, O Christian soul, from this world. In the name of God the Father Almighty who created thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who suffered for thee, in the name of the Holy Spirit, who was poured out upon thee and anointed thee, in communion with all the blessed saints, and aided by the angels and archangels and all the armies of the heavenly host, may thy portion this day be in peace and thy dwelling in the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen.
God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the Church, the King, the Commonwealth, and all people, peace and concord, and to our sinners, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.
in a stunningly move, moving funeral for Queen Elizabeth II at Westminster Abbey. This is the first royal state funeral in Westminster Abbey in more than 260 years. Ending with God Save the King and these bagpipes. With us is Julian Payne, who's previously worked with then Prince Charles, now the King. This is noteworthy. This is, it's a very poignant moment that is the Queen's piper who would play the bagpipes every day for the Queen uh, each morning, wherever she was. And she used to say that it reminded her of Scotland when she wasn't in Scotland. Um, and he was a, he was a very well, he is a very well known figure in her household. So this is a great honor for him uh, and quite a poignant moment for the service. Let's listen in for a moment. And Tina listening to those bagpipes. Just beautiful. It's so beautiful and as perfect as everything about the Queen's sort of public face has always been. You know, she's united a fractious country, a fractious family at this moment. It's so moving. Yeah, it seems so interesting. You know, the first coronation when she was 25, I keep thinking about that, Tina. 25, 25. years old. That was broadcast live. So it's it feels very full circle that as we sit here today, we are sending her on. Absolutely, and her whole last weeks have this great act of completion. You know, she accomplished the, the, the jubilee. She accomplished the appointment of her last prime minister. Her whole to-do list was done. And now this funeral coming at this moment seems like this extraordinary circle. Uh, being completed, it's it's really quite remarkable. Julian, we can't help but notice during the whole service, there's a note on top of the the coffin. We're all trying to figure out what does it say, what, who's it from. But you recognize the handwriting. You said, "Yeah, I, I, I'm familiar with the handwriting. That is definitely a message from the king uh, to his mother." Uh, from what I can see, I think it says in loving memory. Um, I may maybe prove wrong on that, but the, but the wreath, is, as we mentioned before, a very personal wreath with flowers coming from Buckingham Palace, from Clarence House, from Highgrove. Uh, the King does do this when he went to visit the grave of his grandmother uh, uh, in 2020. He took a wreath from the garden at Highgrove. Uh, to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. So it's, um, it's another example of bringing the personal touches to this uh, deeply important national, international moment. Julian, I couldn't help but look at this ashen-faced family. And the king appeared to be quite emotional, especially when everyone was singing God Save the King. I think that's right. He is, he is an, a, a man of great emotion. It's one of the things that I've often felt people don't pick up with him, uh, often because he's doing these state uh, official moments. But as an individual, you do see his mood. He does wear his heart on his sleeve, and today is an incredibly sad day. So, so it, it feels no great surprise to see that sad, you know, written all over his face, actually. I can't imagine, though, what it's like for the family. It's hard enough to, to lose a close family member when nobody knows who they are and nobody knows their name, but to, to have to grieve so publicly and repeatedly over these last 10 days, I would think that it would take a toll on everyone. I think that's right. In, in some ways, though, my sense is that they will take some comfort in the um, sympathy and the outpouring that comes from the public. It will, it will comfort them. And, and some of this structure, some of this formality will, will give them support as well. Because as, as you can imagine, when these moments have passed and the king and the rest of the family have moments for quiet reflection, I think that's when it will go back to being their own memories and their own moments. They're, they're sort of in, in between the two at the moment. Of course, what was really stunning in this service was to hear for the first time a prayer for Queen Camilla. I mean, that is the first time those words have been uttered. And 
such a validation for her and for Charles, who has wanted this all of the last, you know, 30, 40 years. And of course, for Camilla, the greatest reputational turnaround in history. Because she was so unpopular back in the she days, was you know. Just in the 90s, as late as, you know, as recently as that, she was very unpopular. But ever since, she's been married now to him for longer than Diana. And she's proved for him, essentially, what Philip was for the Queen, his strength and stay, as you put it. I she mean. certainly seems to have been embraced by the public, too. Completely embraced by the public. Uh, you know, she's done what Philip did, and he said, you know, the thing to do is to look up, look out, say less, do more. That's what she has been doing with all of her great charity work she has done, and she has really proved that she can pull it off. It's extraordinary. Let's bring in Wesley Kerr, and Wesley, this has been extraordinary to watch this funeral and everything that was said, it was, it was short, relatively, and that's what the Queen wanted. She always liked services to be under an hour. Um, most of her engagements were under an hour, but there were many engagements, many of her favorite hymns, the prayers she would have known, um, and what the Archbishop said was so moving. Death is the door to glory. He talked about that pledge she made when she was 21, when she said, my whole life, whether it will be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. And he said that rarely has a promise been so well kept. He said that few leaders have been so successful. And her example was not through her ambition or her position, but who she followed, and she followed Jesus. He said her service had its foundation in that. He said she was a leader of loving service who didn't cling to power and privilege. So there's a lesson. You've got all the heads of state in the world there. And there's a lesson in her life. How many of them will have a funeral like this? So it's, it's surrounded by the trappings of state. And we're going to see a most astonishing procession out of the Abbey and then the last journey from London, 1.3 miles with the royal family following. But you know, in the end, she's wreathed in the love of the church and the people. And now we're going to see her handed over to the people on the way to Windsor, wreathed in our love. Well, Robert Lacey is joining us now. He's a CBS News royal contributor, biographer, advisor to Netflix, The Crown is with us. And you know, Robert, there's a rich tradition of royal funerals in Britain. the audio with Robert in just a second. We, we couldn't hear him. I'm just I'm just done looking at the family. I am too, Nora. I Walking too. behind the, com the coffin there. It's with particularly all shattering for Andrew. I mean, he is, the queen was his great protector uh, from everybody. And now he's bereft of that protection. And for the first time, he released a statement the other day, yesterday, about his mother. Yes, he said she was uh, called her mother, mummy, your majesty. It was actually very touching because you felt his sense of loss that he's no longer has her as his shield. Just as the nation now has a new king, so the family now reorientate around a new head of the family. It was the Duke of Edinburgh, of course, who famously was the head of the family, and then he passed away, and it was the queen. Now everybody gathers around, around the king, and one of the things that struck me in this service is this is obviously the queen's funeral, but it ends with a everybody singing God Save the King. Yes. And that to me is that it exemplifies this continuation from one sovereign to the next. The monarchy does not stop. There are different people that inhabit the role. And just as we're saying goodbye to one, we're already singing praise for the next one. But Julian, there's, there seems to be the consensus that he is well prepared for this role. He's been, somebody said to me it's, uh, in the line yesterday, they said it's the longest internship anyone has ever had. But do you think that he is prepared himself? Yes, I think um, it's one of those things that he, he knew that he would have a long time as Prince of Wales. He was very keen that he didn't just wait until this role came his way and I think he's worked incredibly hard to make that time as Prince of Wales very uh, fulfilling and, and, and valuable. Unlike his mother of course and unlike his grandfather he knew that he would be king. It took changes in history for it to come to the direction of those people before him so I always felt when I was talking to him, although he didn't talk about it a lot, when he mm -hmm. talked about moving up one, as he would say, moving this was something one. that he knew 
was coming and he knew how he would want to approach it. But his mother is so beloved. Do you think that gives added pressure to him? I think that he, more than anybody else, knows that this is, uh, he follows in the footsteps of somebody who is not just another monarch, is almost the monarch of, of, of modern times. I therefore don't think he will be thinking about how I follow her. He'll simply be thinking about duty and service. It's how they approach it is, this is a job I'm asked to do. I will do it for as long as I'm required to do so, as long as I have left on this planet, as he has said. Uh, and then it will be the turn of the Prince of Wales and then Prince George after that. He's also proved, I think, already that, you know, he is a great statesman, Charles. He knows all of these heads of state. When he had that reception at Buckingham Palace, this was a reunion of many friends, in a well, sense. Don't forget, he also met and spoke with Winston Churchill and every world leader since then as well. And I, I saw how he handled his statecraft when there were people of many countries in a room together. He is extremely experienced, and that is, I think, whilst he's he's not the youngest uh, king to come to the throne, that experience that he brings with him will be really fantastically in, useful. In fact, he's the oldest to well, come to the throne, yes. I, I wasn't going to dwell on the age. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, with age brings experience. With age brings experience. And, of course, in speaking with um, David Cameron and other prime ministers, said they had a private audience, which were called practice audience with him. So, yes, he is, in many ways, has been practicing for decades for this role and has met just as many foreign foreign ministers, in fact, as, as yeah. almost but you anyone. Say, the irony you say is he's not... a very fit 73. Yes, yes. yes he's uh, very fit 73. He, he is someone who um, uh, ha, ha, would be out walking daily, and I can tell you as someone that had to try and keep up on those <laughs> on those walks, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, he is a, he may be 73 in years, but he's he's half that, and in terms of his fitness, it's quite extraordinary. Wesley, this is quite a moment as this we're is seeing an the coffin. Moment. I've seen Her Majesty walk out here so often. It's, it's it's heartbreaking, but the sun has come out as 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 the coffin leaves Westminster Abbey for the last time. This place she loves so much. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the gun carriage awaits. So we'll see a reverse of what we saw earlier, but a much longer procession. So we'll see Her Majesty go past um, Whitehall and Downing Street into Horse Guards Parade, the precincts of the palace, where so often she was there for trooping the colour, and then along the Mall and past Buckingham Palace for the last time, up Constitution Hill, and then, then the pub, you know, there'll, there'll be enormous crowds. There's, there's the Dean about to say good, goodbye to her, and, and the Wesley. procession about to begin with His and Majesty. And Wesley, our own Holly Williams is right there. Holly? Laura, while witnessing this powerful, symbolic, historic funeral were representatives from around 200 different countries. The mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, actually pointed out that it's been decades since so many world leaders have come together in one space. It really was a who's who inside Westminster Abbey of presidents, kings, queens and other heads of state. That, of course, included President Biden, but also uh, royals from Spain, Belgium, Denmark, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden. Uh, the Emperor and Empress of Japan. And what a sermon they heard from the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Wesley touched on it. He said there was a pattern for leaders to be exalted in life but forgotten in death. That's a message for dictators, if ever we've heard one. And he contrasted those who cling to power and privileges with the Queen's own life of service. Also notable was those who were those who were not present today. Uh, President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine could not come. Uh, he's fighting a war against an invading Russian army. His wife, the First Lady Olena Zelenska, came in his stead. And not invited today was the President of Russia, Vladimir Putin. Holly Williams, thank you. Again, a very somber moment here as the Queen's coffin is placed back on the gun carriage. Nora, I always say this job gives us a front row seat to history, and we really do have a front row seat as we're sitting here from our vantage point. Just over our shoulder, we can see the Queen's coffin being loaded. We can see them leaving the church. And it really is a very thrilling and, I have to say, really very moving moment just to see this. It really is. And, of course, it's the last Queen we're going to say goodbye yes. to for a very, very long time. The next two... Uh, kings are coming next and uh... you know Tina and Julie and I have many British friends who have been saying to me nobody can do this the way we do and I'm so proud to be British today do you all feel that as well totally Wesley, feel that. Julie and Tina mm. 
Totally. Incredible. It's just astonishing. Um, it's how she would have wanted it, and it's how we like it. Don't forget, she was the head of all the military services, and all those people working today will want to discharge this last duty for her impeccably, and it will matter so much to them. I remember when I was in the royal household for the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral, it was the same thing. And also the royal household itself. They will be working incredibly hard to send her off and not make a single mistake and really make this an incredibly special day. That card that is atop that wreath of roses that was chosen by the King says, in loving and devoted memory from the King as he plays that note. And Wesley, I want to ask you as we watch this too about the orb, the scepter, the imperial crown atop. The yeah, these, these are the, the symbols of, of Her Majesty's high office. The, the imperial state crown was actually designed for Queen Victoria, and it's the second one that she would have worn on Coronation Day. She would have been crowned with St. Edward's crown, dating from 1661. And, that, and that's when the scepter and orb date from. So, so after the Civil War, the crown jewels had to be remade. But, but, but there's some of, you know, so I think on Queen, on the Imperial State Crown, it has Queen Elizabeth's pearls on it. Mm -hmm. So there's artifacts going back you know, to, to, to ancient history. And these are, are symbols of office. And that crown will be refitted for King it, Charles. It also shows, I think, that tradition is not about the curation of dead things, that somehow it's actually about the continuation of life itself. And there is something so deeply moving about all of this pageantry. It's not flummery. It's, it's, it's history on the move. You know, I noticed that two of the Queen's granddaughters, Eugenia and Beatrice, in their note said, we just thought you would always be there. Yes. And that's this feeling I think, that's I think... because the Queen was through World War II, through the Beatles, through the internet yes. age, the long arc of her history and this beautiful music that we hear now. Oh, it's breathtaking. No, it's interesting to hear her actual grandchildren say, we always thought you would be there. Everyone in the line said, we can't imagine life without her. She's the only queen, the only monarch I've ever known and will know. And the, the sentiment was repeated over and over. We the can't only imagine. Female yes. monarch. Sure. The only female known. monarch that we've ever known. known. And of course, for nine out of 10 of the people living in this country today, she is the only monarch they've ever known because of those 70 plus years, it's an extraordinary. Right. It's almost we knew the seasons by where she was, right? Absolutely. I mean, Christmas Absolutely. in Sandringham, June, she's in Windsor. It's one of the Hi, things she's working in, in, in the in household. Arnold. You can absolutely predict where everybody will be because their lives yeah. are planned six, 12 months in advance. So you know absolutely when they're going to be in different places and at even at what time. And the, sh the, the television shot right now is on the coffin as it should be, but we can see now the rest of the royal family getting into cars, most of the women, including the queen consort, to travel behind. But walking behind the coffin will be some members, I believe, of the royal family. We'll see them shortly. And this, of course, the Royal Navy, 142 members that are helping to pull this gun carriage. Extraordinary, not horses, members of the Royal Navy. This is going to be about 1.7 mile procession through central London, Wesley. Well, it, it, it's 27 miles, but the first 1.3 miles on the gun carriage and as it were on foot. So slowly it through, through Royal London and then the last 25 miles through the People's London. So, so without having to go through security barriers, although no, none of the people that we'll see today have had to be searched, which is just amazing. Um, but, but they're not in the secure area in the, uh, once it gets to the Wellington Arch and it will move to the hearse. And then I think we'll see hundreds of thousands of people in Hyde Park and in West London and in Windsor for this last chance to say goodbye on a route that the Queen knew so well. This was her, you know, this was her weekly commute in from Windsor to London, often on exactly the, the same route. And we'll pass so many places. She, yes. she was walked in a perambulator in Hyde Park when she was young. So it, it's her life 
and how routine, as we've been hearing about the, the, the routine through the year, that there's a routine through the week. Mm -hmm. So for the last time, she leaves her beloved capital, and we say go goodbye to her with great love and warmth. And, and we say thank job you. well done. Thank you, ma'am. God bless job you. Well done. We say job well done. Job yes. well done. Seven decades she of has. service, Seven including decades. on her last She once said, I, I always did my, try to do my best. <laughs> I think we can agree that she succeeded. We just saw shots from the Canadian Mounties there, which just reminded me there is a whole Commonwealth dimension to this as well. More than 50 countries of the Commonwealth that she was the head of, and as well as the 15 realms where she was head of states as well. So this is happening in the UK today, but this is the Queen of Australia, the Queen of New Zealand, the Queen of Canada, the Queen of Tuvalu, Vanuatu, the list goes on. So this is something which is truly, truly a, a global moment, and it's great to see those Commonwealth countries represented in the service today. And in the, and in the procession, Mounties, Gurkhas from Nepal, troops from New Zealand, they, you know, they, they've, they came here very, very quickly and they've, they, while jet lagged, they've been rehearsing for this, but they're so proud to take a part of it. But as we mentioned, that 1.7 mile procession, they will walk that part until they get to Wellington um, Arch, that will be the king and of course the other three children of Queen Elizabeth. I want to bring in Robert Lacey. He's a CBS News royal contributor. And Robert, your thoughts as you've just watched the funeral and this procession along with us. Well, you can just see just an incredible, I read that there are going to be 4,000 members of the U.S. military. They are part of this procession. One thing we haven't talked about is what you can't see as much as the amount of security in order to protect all of the people of London and the more than million um, people from not just the United Kingdom but around the world who have come here to witness this moment. And then, of course, this incredible yes. ceremony. Now, let's talk about the security guys for just a second because they said that they were expecting at least two million people to come to to the area today to witness this. They have, it's the largest security operation ever that they've had in history, over 10,000 police officers. We met many of them up close and personal as we were traveling at 4.30 this morning. Things are very locked up, very tight. They're checking all the credentials. It does feel very safe here, I have to say. I mean, very few of the officers, of course, armed, and none of the people who we will see in these crowds will have been individually searched. So, yes, I suppose there's an element of jeopardy, but there's an awful lot that goes on behind the scenes. You know, at home, we think of the President of the United States as the Commander-in-Chief. But here, the Queen is the Commander-in-Chief, which is why we see this, and now the King, this extraordinary military display, correct? Absolutely. So it gives us an impartial focus of unity. You've got a non-political figure who's at the head of the state and the head of the armed forces. And all the people that served in Her Majesty's forces through this long reign felt an incredibly close personal bond with Her Majesty, so, so above politics. And I think the King continues that. There's the, 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 the Queen's most, most sacred annual uh, duty was laying the wreath on the cenotaph. Uh, That's she right. only ever missed it, I think, once when Prince Charles, or twice she, when Prince she, Charles had to do it for her. But he, that was her most sacred thing because she really connected with the military and felt she was bound by that whole World War II ethic with the military. Well, she, she you know, commander in chief, as you say, was was her role, and and laying the wreath on behalf of the nation was that really, really significant moment. And I remember a few years ago when that job was passed on to the then Prince of Wales. It felt like another significant moment. All Although, of course, she remained Queen right to, to the very end, but she was gradually bringing in her family to support her in those duties in later life. But, Julian, how often do you get to see service and duty and faith and family all coming together under the, uh, under the, the reign of one person? All of it. All of She's those such a uniting are connected. figure, which is when people ask what the point of the monarchy is, we're now seeing what the point of the monarchy is, which is that it's above politics, it's above all of these things and that, that can bring everyone together right. that underneath role, that banner. Head of state, 
head of nation, head of the church, head of the army. I mean, this is not this is not a small job, and you have to give your focus to all of those things. And absolutely, that was what she did over over 70 years. And the military was at the core of it. She was from a military family, and the royal household, as much as the military around it, was run along those lines. It was an extremely well organised and well oiled machine, and I'm sure it will continue to be. By the way, military training does the royal family very proud because the stamina they all have, it's also about that military training. Let's listen in for just a moment. seeing a procession that can really be described as the people's farewell. Mark Phillips also has a front row seat. Mark, what can you tell us? Uh, it's just kind of interesting the way that this whole ceremony has been framed, bookended almost. Uh, we started with the religious ceremony and of course the family grieving uh, in, the, in the, uh, the abbey. But this part of the ceremony is really a farewell tour for the business side of the Queen's uh, life and the Queen's work. It's taking her through the ceremonial boulevards of Royal London. It'll take her right up the Mall and right by Buckingham Palace, which of course she used to call the office because she preferred to live out uh, in Windsor, and then take her up Constitution Hill uh, outside of, uh, of the Royal Parks area. And that will be the end of her in Royal London. The transfer then 25 odd miles out to Windsor, where she'll re emerge back into the royal environment for the internment, for the service, and then the internment uh, with Philip, who, who died last year. But this, this is kind of the people's farewell to the Queen. This is where the people who are lining these routes in the same way as they lined the procession when the coffin was brought to Westminster Hall last week, in the same way as they've been lining up but to view the coffin uh, for the four days that it was lying in state. This is the people's last time to bid uh, farewell and to say goodbye, as we've said over and over again, to the only Queen many of them have ever known. But these ceremonies kind of have evolved over the years, and I'm here uh, with Robert Lacey, who's a royal historian and biographer. And, I mean, this kind of thing doesn't get done very often, but when it gets done, boy, does it get done. Well, thank you very much. The British are good at it, as Wesley said. This current set of regalia go back to the 1660s after we briefly tried a bit of republicanism and decided it wasn't for us. And I was struck by the way in which next time we see these regalia, the crown, the orb, the scepter, well, we'll see them this evening taken off the coffin. And then next time we see them ceremonially will be, what, in nine months or so next summer? Whenever it is. For the coronation right. of the new king. So the continuity you're referring to, the history, it'll all be then seen in, in a new light. And you're right. The Queen's reign will be passed, and everybody will be focusing. We're going to get new coins. We're going to get new stamps. We're going to get new, new money. Bank, no, new money with all sorts of new digital things on them, mm. but a new monarch's face as well. But it is. It, it's continuity in, in personality. The next three generations, the current next two generations of royalty were on parade here as well, certainly in, in King Charles, uh, in Prince William, and in the young Prince George. We have three men in a row uh, to look forward to coming up. But even in terms of the, the continuity of the family, it's the continuity of the symbolism represented 
in the scepter, in the orb, in the crown, and in this kind of ceremony. But there is also the challenge that the new king's going to have to face of changing that to a certain degree. Mm. And in a way, we've seen that already. He, his most important visits have been to Scotland, Northern Ireland, and also to Wales, where there are serious demands for devolution, for separation. And actually, if the, if the monarchy has one important political role at the moment in, in British affairs, it's to preserve a sense of unity and prevent us slipping up. Well, we'll see what happens. Anyway, thank you, Robert Lacey. Thank you. And we're right. Thank you, Robert. We're, we're glad to hear from you. When he said the money is going to change, can you imagine all the people that are running out now just to get a little, uh, some kind of money, myself included, that includes the Queen's but, face before it changes? Well, I don't mind but Julian, he said that the coronation and Tina, that the coronation would be nine months from now. Why nine months? What is that timeline about? Well, that it would take nine one, one of the one of the things is the, it's a it's a ceremonial moment and and there are obligations in terms of the amount of daylight hours that you need uh, uh, which will which will push you into uh, the spring and the summer there's also other things which happen in the calendar and it's actually quite hard to land that day when it doesn't suddenly bump into other things so uh, traditionally there are moments in the year when you can stage events like this and they tend to be spring summer and I think that's why we're being guided towards that date now. I think there's also a sense that with a year in which we've had the jubilee of this extraordinary funeral there needs to be a careful think about what the coronation will offer perhaps a more spiritual di a dimension. I have to say that looking at this I've decided that the great British talent isn't for literature or philosophy or gardening it's actually for military choreography. Uh, I don't think there's anyone else who could put on this. I mean, you have to ask, will anyone ever be loved by the nation so much again? I, mean, I think your, your, your point about the coronation, you know, perhaps being different is, is definitely true. The king will be very mindful of his philosophy of a slim down monarchy, of value for money and not wanting to look out of kilter with the times. And these are difficult times. We're going to go into a very difficult winter, all of us. And I think that he will be really mindful of how that coronation should look and feel. It mustn't be discordant with what's happening in the world. Many people wonder what does his version of a slim down, slim down monarchy mean? Who is involved in a slim down monarchy? Who think, stays? Who goes? Is that a fair question? Yeah, I think you you saw uh, an early a trailer, if you like, in 2012, and the, those that were on the balcony. Since then, we've had some changes with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex making their lives in America. They're no longer uh, available as working members of the royal family. Uh, so we'll probably see other people coming in, but it will be a smaller number. And there you see Princess Charlotte and Prince George, along Speaking with the Queen Speaking of slim-down monarchy, there it. <laughs> there it. With the Queen. And ten years Prince. from now, that's who we'll be talking about. And they, they look quite somber, and of course they're on the mall right, mall right now, which of course has been was created to honor Queen Victoria, and you can see Buckingham Palace beyond there. And has just gone past a little a few moments ago, uh, 10 Downing Street as well. And having Prince George and Princess Charlotte there, bear in mind that that will have been a decision from the Prince and Princess of Wales. And they are very careful about how much exposure they give their children to the media. But this will matter to them to allow their children to be part of you know, their great-grandmother's funeral. That, that's important for them as well. I noticed and they decided to let little Louis stay home. He's four. Uh, he had a big everybody summer already. Got a, everybody got a kick out of him <laughs> earlier this year. He had a big summer. <laughs> and Tina, I mean, what kind of powerful message does this send to have Prince George, who is second in line to the throne, be here today? It is the statement that this tradition that we've been seeing is going to continue. I mean, in the same way that Charles stepped so flawlessly in, William will step flawlessly in. We don't know that George will step floor to see him. Maybe he'll say, I don't want any of this. That will be a turn up. But Are I you suspect... allowed to say that? <laughs> well, it has happened before with Edward VIII. But, uh, but that I... was for the love of a woman. That was for the love of a woman. As opposed to, I don't want um, this job. But I think, you know, that you're going to see... Uh, this has already formed the kind of um, tapestry of his mind. You know, he's, this is, this is his these first are, big royal moment. These are small layers which go in from the earliest yeah. of ages when you start yeah. to become that 
new generation of the royal family. I don't think you could have ever said to the to the now king, when did you first start yeah. to realize that you were going to be king? I think it came with consciousness yes. in a sense for him. And I'm I do sure have to say in the Jubilee when Prince George looked out over the crowd, I saw a tiny moment of alarm on his little face. As if to say, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I think well I think they're still adjusting. I know that the Prince and Princess of Wales have been have been really careful to, to try and keep their lives as normal as possible, but explain to them there is this other side of what mummy and daddy do and, mm. and, and that gradual, gradual introduction I think will be is the kindest way to do it. Well also their great grandmother has died, you know, someone that George called Gangan, -Gan, you know, yes. and um, referred to her very sweetly and we heard uh, the Princess of Wales telling mourners that, that she had been talking to her children about what this loss meant and she shared that uh, with people and, you know, as they just pass in front of Buckingham Palace, that's of course the statue to Queen Victoria, right? That big gold statue that you see right there. And and we, as we were talking about this, Tina, this is really Queen Elizabeth II was the last female head of the House of Windsor. Yes, it does turn out that women are very good at this job, right? Yes. Elizabeth I, Queen Victoria. They get named. They get they get eras named after them. Yeah, right. The Elizabethan era. The Elizabethan mm -hmm. era. The Victorian era. Mm -hmm. And I think even for those members of the family who, who aren't monarch, the female uh, role models in that family are hugely important. They are, in many ways, I think, the connectors behind the scenes. And, and, and I think that you see the sort of the family dynamic is facilitated by the, the women within the family, as well as carrying out all their own state and nation work and their support of all their philanthropic activity. It really is a very sophisticated role that they play within the institution. You know, it's interesting when you talk about the children, I'm fascinated by that because from a child's point of view, when you lose your great grandmother, one of the children said, yeah, but now they're together. Now they're, yes. whatever they called Prince Philip, what did they call Papa? I, I, I don't know. I suspect probably Papa or Grandpa. Oh. Yeah. Granny, yeah. Uh, probably not great but, granny. But they were saying that now the Prince two Philip. are together. Prince Philip. Oh. We, what did the children call Prince Philip, the Grandpapa. younger children? Grandpapa. They were but saying also, now they're together, and I yeah. thought there was something very sweet about and that. Also, they understood that. That closeness of that family, I mean, the Queen's own family, you know, her father used to talk about we us four but about the Queen and Margaret and now us four she's going to be buried with us four with of course Philip joining yes. so they're all going to be together it's very touching actually that desire but this to is, be together this in that crib it's their family but this is their normal don't forget as well I mean I remember Talking what, what are we looking at now? This, this is arrow, the this, this is the horse guards They're going parade. Into the, this is the official entrance to the palace. Okay. So it's, it's, it's horse guards parade where the guard is changed daily. And when you go through that arch, you're in the court of St James, but you're also in St James's Park. So they're now going, as it were, from religious and political London into Royal London one last time across Royal London through these parks that in a way she's presided over. Theoretically, Her Majesty owns or owned the Royal Parks. Yeah, I just so, thought that was an interesting shot. I wanted the viewers to know what we were looking at. Julian, please finish the point you were making. Well, I think the, the, for, for the grandchildren, great-grandchildren and grandchildren, this is their normal. So as you are growing up in this family, you can't get outside of that bubble. And when um, people ask about the king and the queen consort, one of the great things about their relationship is the queen consort had 50 years of her life living outside the royal bubble. So she's this fabulous bridge of being able to go into the institution, which she's now been married to for 17 years, and translate the outside world in. And, and just help the king know what feels like it's acceptable, what's normal. Just bring a bit of normalcy inside it because if you're Prince George, you can never truly get out of it. As much as your right. parents will try and make things as regular as possible. How normal you. can it be, right? How normal can Absolutely. It be? And they, you saw that with William and Harry all through their lives. They've tried, in a sense, to have a quote, normal time. But essentially, they are the kind of the princes next door, if, if you like. What I think also must be happening for William is, you know, he, he as a child, when he was at Eton, a young man at Eton, he would go and have tea with the 
Queen, and she would really talk to him about the royal role and sort of lead him by example and by stories of how when she was a 25-year-old monarch, she took over, and he loved hearing those stories. So he's also, as you were talking, the point about absorbing. I mean, they've absorbed all this in this very organic way. And I know that uh, the king spends time with his grandchildren, particularly up at Burke Hall in the summer, and uh, I've been told of delightful stories of the king holding George by the hand, walking down the corridor and showing him red squirrels <laughs> that have crept into the house when they've left nuts and things for them to eat. But this lovely image of grandfather and grandson holding hands and sharing stories themselves. So that will repeat. We'll see that again with the new king, I'm sure. And Julian, you spent time with the household staff recently Can you of, of King Charles. Can you share what they're thinking, how they're feeling? Yeah, I mean, like the king, they're all pretty tired, but I think they're, <laughs> they're, uh, they're, they're really, really pleased at how well the ceremonial has gone, and everybody is really delighted at how the affection of the nation does seem to be transferring to the king very naturally, very seamlessly. So I think inside the household, everybody is determined to do the best they can for the, uh, for the queen and also to set up the king for his reign in the best way possible. So a lot of, a lot of tired faces, a few bags under eyes, but, but a lot of, a lot of um, satisfaction mm -hmm. as well. And Wesley, place us where we are now, where the procession is in the significance. So we're going past the memorial to um, the guards who sacrificed their life in the First World War, and we're just leaving horse guards. So this is where Her Majesty, on her official birthday, would, would ride in a carriage procession with the family. And she, she's, so this is where she would arrive, and now she's leaving for the last time. And that would be where the official birthday was celebrated with an amazing military parade and 6,000 people watching. Um, so she's going back towards the palace to pass it for the last time. I remember um, being at the Queen's birthday parade at Buckingham Palace and seeing them when they all came back in. And what you never saw away from the cameras is that afterwards the, um, the staff would come out with carrots on a silver salver, which the Queen would feed to the horses to say, well done a for, a, for a job, well done, yeah. <laughs> nice. And the park staff would pick up the detritus from the horses <laughs> before the fly pass that would take place. So with, again, with amazing military precision, and it was a very joyful occasion for her, the official birthday, the military parade, and then all the family gathered on the balcony for the fly pass. But that'll be a diminished family and a smaller family group anyway. Tonight they're going to have the very personal burial after all the pomp and ceremony is over. That's going to be the time when the emotions can finally speak, I would think. Strictly family, no TV cameras. I think they, I, I think they deserve that after having yes. been presenting yes, the whole uh, activity for the public under that scrutiny. Just to have that moment, just that final moment to say goodbye as a family, I think will be hugely important for them. I was touched to read that when Charles went to Highgrove uh, for that one day in between all the pomp and ceremony, he actually went to the little chapel in his garden at Highgrove and spent some private sacred moments thinking about his mother. Like, like his mother, he is a, a very spiritual man, and yes, there is a, there is a place in, in the grounds at Highgrove where he can go and pray and, and reflect, and, and I'm sure that that one day will have been vital. That's going to carry on, I'm sure, for, for a long time. I mean, we all know losing a loved one takes a long time to adjust to, and I, I, it will be no different for them. We've been talking about the billions around the world that are watching this live on television, the millions gathered here in London. Ramey Innocencio is there amongst the many who have turned out on the mall. Ramey? Hi, Nora. Yes, there is a wave of anticipation rising amongst the crowd here. I talked to many people as they arrived here earlier today, and you named the emotion. They were feeling it. People said sorrow, of course, at the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, but a lot of people over the past 10 days of national mourning have shifted to the emotion of celebration of her life, everything that she did over her 96 years. Another person I spoke to said, that she was excited to be here to share it with her five-year-old son, but she also wanted to tone that back. With that said, everyone here is just expectant, anticipating right now, watching what you're seeing alive right now, uh, the tens of millions of people watching across the United Kingdom, making their final farewell to, to their queen. Rem 
Jaime and Asensio, thank you. Let's bring in Roxana Saberi. She is in Hyde Park, where people have been watching this on big screens. I understand the parks are full. And Nora, Roxana? People have been watching the proceedings here today. Uh, quietly, solemnly, and very thoughtfully on this big screen behind me. They've been speaking in hushed tones, some patting each other on the back to comfort them. It's pretty much what you would expect at a funeral, except here there are tens of thousands of people. And let me ask Sam to just pan over a little bit to see the crowds. Some have started to filter out, filter out but many still remain to watch the funeral procession. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of families. You can see there are a lot of families here. Parents told us they brought their children because they wanted them to be part of history and also because they see the queen as a role model, one that exemplifies hard work and sacrifice. As one woman said, the queen couldn't clock out at 6 p.m. In fact, she didn't clock out of her job for 70 years. In addition to Hyde Park, where we are, the today's events are being shown on screens live across the country at cathedrals and squares, and you just heard a minute gun fired here in Hyde Park by the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. People told me they wanted to come here because they wanted to feel like they're part of a community, to be part of this moment that is greater than themselves, and also to publicly express their gratitude and grief for the Queen. And soon we will see the procession passing by the southern end of Hyde Park, which isn't far from here, which will give people one last chance to say a final farewell to the Queen. Nora and Gail. All right, thank you, Roxana. We're going to go now to Holly Williams. She is at Westminster where the procession is passing by. We were talking earlier, Holly, about security and how tight Gail, it is. Just, go ahead. That, that's right, Gail. We're actually just seeing the guests pouring out of Westminster Abbey now. Uh, there were around 2,000 people present for the funeral. And with so many presidents, kings, queens, and sultans, this was an unprecedented security operation. It was apparently the most complex security operation that has ever been staged in this country, and that includes the 2012 uh, London Olympics. The mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, said the authorities were juggling, and he said, quote, there could be bad people wanting to cause damage to some of our world leaders. So far, everything seems to have gone smoothly. There are around 10,000 police officers on duty, including many armed officers. That's unusual in this country. Uh, police officers don't generally uh, carry firearms. There are also around 1,500 uh, military personnel uh, drafted in. And one of the very interesting security measures was that most world leaders were bust from a different location to Westminster Abbey. One notable exception made was President Biden, who was allowed to drive his regular armoured car, which is known as the Beast. One British official was quoted as saying that this event uh, was akin to organising around 100 state visits all at the same time. I know, Holly, I was going to uh, pick up on the buses because the, the leaders, the prime ministers, royalty aren't used to being put on shuttle buses like most of us are. Do you have, and we saw President Biden, of course, in the Beast. Did you hear any reaction from them about how they felt about that? Or did they just think, look, we are here for the Queen and that's all that matters? I didn't hear anything directly. I guess you'd have to ask them. I think you're right. I think for some of them, uh, it would be a humbling experience. Yes. And, you know, I think uh, being a humbled leader is one of the things exactly. that the Archbishop of Canterbury talked about uh, during his sermon. But I should say that actually at William and Kate's wedding, we also saw members of the royal family bust to Westminster Abbey. Yes, it's royals. They're just like us. Thank you very much, Holly. But I also I, have one message for all of those heads, yeah. prime ministers. You are temporary. Yes. <laughs> You're going to be gone soon. This is what it actually looks like to be there for 70 years. Dream on, guys. Get in your bus and behave. And there is King Charles III on this almost two-mile walk, this procession. Um, and this ring of steel is what the security mm. is being called, and it's 23 miles of barriers that have been put up to control the massive crowds that are here in London. But you know, Nora, the crowd is so well behaved. Yes. I have to tell you, no matter where you walk, there are large numbers of people. I went to go look at the floral display yesterday. We were down by Westminster Abbey looking at the people who were in the queue, the line, to see, to see the Queen. And everybody is so thoughtful and so 
careful and so respectful. That's what I'm looking for, so respectful. Tina, does the popularity of Queen Elizabeth transfer to King Charles? Well, I think he's done an incredible job of getting into that space left by her immediately and filling that space with that sense of continuity of the sovereign. But I also think that the beauty of this pageant has really kind of concealed the tectonic nature of this shift. We are now unquestionably in the new era, the next era, the post-Elizabethan age. And in a moment, you know, the, things have stopped for a second, but we are in this very turbulent time. Will Charles be able to be what the Queen was, which was this extraordinarily calm presence, this soothing presence, you know, above all of that? We'll see. I mean, you know, he's actually a great statesman compared to the new Prime Minister who's very inexperienced. I mean, in that sense, it's good for him because it's, it makes him look it even more a person of stature. It's interesting. There's been some early polling, and and although the family themselves don't don't use and rely on polling, he he has his popularity has shot up actually in the yeah. in these last 10, 11 days. So um, they don't live by polling, but I'm sure they'll be aware of it and they'll be reassured to see that. Some people may have read that last night there was an extraordinary gathering at Buckingham Palace. Emperors, kings, queens, all together in, a, in an occasion that had many people worrying about some diplomatic mishaps of people bumping into each other who've had conflicts in the past. Yeah, don't place certain people next to certain people because there's well, still some bruised feelings. Well, yes. there weren't because they were allowed to roam freely, which was one of the interesting things about who would engage with one another. Mm -hmm. And Tina, it's a reminder of the soft power of uh, the monarchy, correct? Bringing Absolutely. people together like that, that would, that would maybe enemies in the past or enemies now. There is no one else, there is no other institution, no other person that could convene a gathering like that. And no one else that could create this kind of focus right now, except perhaps the opening of the Olympics. You know, I mean, we'll never see that kind of convening power ever again, I don't think. But that's important because we now have, it's been many years since there's been a head of state for the UK travel abroad and have state visits. The yeah. Queen stopped travelling in, I think, 2015, 2016. And so for the first time on the international stage, the UK will be able to get out there again and really bang that drum. And these are important times. You know, we're in a post-Brexit era. We're all recovering from the pandemic. That opportunity to bring a little bit of what we see here around the world will be fantastically useful, I think, for, for the UK. Do you expect the king to travel? Absolutely. With the queen? Yeah. Absolutely. I think that not just the king, but I think you'll see the Prince and Princess of Wales guessing around the Commonwealth pretty sharpish pretty quickly, actually. I, I read in one of the papers that they had mentioned they're already planning a trip to Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. Anxious to get out and about after the pandemic the where nobody's really the, traveling. The Prince and Princess of Wales. The King and all Queen. The King and the Queen. There, there'll, be a, there'll be a whole... Uh, all the plans that were on the table will have been torn up. They'll have sat down again now and said, OK, we have a King, a Queen, we have a Prince and Princess of Wales, we have a Commonwealth, we have realms to cover. How are we going to sequence that? And that will be a really important piece of work. I mean, you think these last 10, 11 days have been hard work for them. They have got several several years ahead of them of, of getting around the whole globe and really establishing this new era, this new reign. It's going to be a hugely busy time for them. Yeah. What, what the, the king is going to greatly enhance, I think, the soft power of England because everyone is going to want to host the first royal mm. visit of the king. And he has got an enormous calling card right now. But it is, it's, it's magic. I, I travelled abroad with them usually a dozen or so countries a year for, for six years. Everywhere you meant, went, there's something different about a royal visit because it's not political, it's not a celebrity, it's something that's rare and everybody is interested in it and it brings everybody from the members of the public uh, to heads, you know, heads of the state you're going to visit. I remember going to Italy and it being absolutely pandemonium wherever they went and this was before he was in the so-called top job. And it's, it's an uncomfortable topic, but do you think the king and the queen consort Will, it, will address the problems that people have with the monarchy when they talk about colonization and slavery and lack of acknowledgement about that. You know, many people say the Queen did address it some, but that she could have gone further. And I know it makes people, it is uncomfortable, but I think that there are many people that still feel very hurt and feel left out about how 
how she reigned sometimes. Well, Wesley, I, I want to hear well, from Julian yes. too. I think the Queen addressed it for her era. So in that post-war period, it was all about decolonization. It was about the empire going, in, in normally voluntarily, some, in some cases unwillingly. So beginning with India um, and the Indian subcontinent and then Africa. So 45 countries achieved their independence. And at that stage, that was enough for them. That, that, that was where the energy went. And many chose to keep the monarchy, like the country that my, my parents came but from, But now Jamaica. in this new era, but, but now, now yeah. Yeah, So th there's got to be looked at again. Now, Charles is, is, is very up for that, really. And we saw that in Barbados when he was there, when they chose to, 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 to become a republic that stayed in the Commonwealth. It's not going to be so easy in other countries. In Jamaica, they need a referendum to do that. In Canada, it needs the majority of all the provinces. In, so I, I think that it, it's not going to happen quite as quickly as people think, um, be, partly because the monarchy is, is reconnected in these countries as well. But it will be by consent. It will be by these countries' consent. The monarchy, Buckingham Palace, will not resist it. But he seems to be aware that it is an issue, wouldn't you say, Julian? He, he, he is absolutely aware that this is an issue. He, he's followed closely everything that's happened these last couple of years and the shift in sentiment. At the core, he understands that if he serves people, he serves at their, at their discretion. Yes. And he's been very clear. I remember talking to him about this, thinking, oh, what can we do to kind of, should we be doing something to keep these realms going? And his view was absolutely not. If it is what people want me to do, I will serve. Mm -hmm. If it is not, that's the right thing for them. Okay. And, and he gave a speech as recently as the um, Commonwealth Heads of Government this year, where he said it will be a matter for each country to decide their relationship with 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 the monarchy. And, and he I will take his, his he will take cues from them as to how to proceed. It's all right. And okay. then all I think stay in the Commonwealth. I think that's an important point, which which is this you know, common association of which they chose unanimously to make him the next head of it. All right. Well, well, in Jamaica, where there's an issue, they want to. Um, have a referendum, but they put their foreign secretary up recently to be head of the Commonwealth. All right, we want to bring in Mark Phillips. Mark Phillips, hello again. The Queen's coffin is making its way to you. It's making its way to a, a very important juncture in this whole day. Uh, it's approaching the top end of the mall toward the uh, Victoria Monument and to Buckingham Palace, which, as we said earlier, was what the Queen used to refer to as the office. It's where the business of the, the Queen takes place, and now the King takes place. You just talked about how there was an important reception here the other night that uh, King Charles now headed. This is where the business of monarchy happens. And and there'll be a big change people are anticipating now in how that business is, uh, is taking place, largely because with the Queen, you know, the Queen never gave an interview. We never knew what, where she stood on any of the issues uh, of the day. Charles, we know almost everything about everything that he thinks. Uh, his, his opinions are, are tried and true, particularly as they affect uh, the environment and He's against industrialized agriculture and that kind of thing. He's very much uh, an environmentalist king. And he will have a kind of power. You mentioned soft power. He will have the power that monarchs here have because of their special stature, and that is the power to convene. He'll bring people together. There's a hush descending now, I must say, as uh, the cortege, including the coffin, uh, approaches the palace here, because this is such a, an important moment. It's where the business of royalty is being transferred to Charles. Robert Lacey, the historian and royal biographer, is with me again. And are we seeing something? To, you know, can we feel change in the air here? It's almost as if we can. Yeah, you're right about the business of monarchy. Of course, uh, King Prince Charles proved himself a very shrewd businessman in raising money for his charities. Um, and we can presume the same thing will happen. There is talk, for example, that he will actually open up Buckingham Palace for the public. Hmm. They're changing the guard at Buckingham Palace. And charging. Christopher, and charging to see Christopher, Ro <laughs> Christopher Robin and Alice will have to pay when they come. Uh, that is the way monarchy survives. We're looking here. Um, sorry, I think I said this before as a proud Brit. There's no monarchy in, in, in Europe that does it better than this. Although, let's not forget, 
This is not the only monarchy in Europe. Um, some of the most rational and civilized countries in Europe, like Sweden and Norway and um, Holland, Denmark, they all see the virtue of a constitutional monarchy that keeps patriotic feeling, emotion separate from politics. All right, but nobody does it like the House of Windsor. We talk about the bicycling monarchies of Scandinavia and that kind of thing. Nobody will, well, maybe people want to see Prince William on a bike, but I don't think they want to see King, King Charles uh, on a bike. It's this kind of glorious ceremony that distinguishes this monarchy from all the others. Do you think that will survive? Do you think as part of this discussion of slimming down volume for money, we'll see less of this sort of thing? I don't think we will see less of this sort of thing because another aspect of these military parades around the palace and the guards at the palace, they are potent tools for the recruitment for the British Armed Forces. The prestige of belonging to a regiment, um, which isn't just called after your local county, but it is headed by Princess Anne or, um, uh, or even Prince Andrew and certainly by Prince William. Um, all of this is another aspect of the fabric of British life that is kept together and strong. Robert Lacey, thanks very much. Gail, Noah. All right. Thank you very much, Mark Phillips, Sunday Times Royal Editor. That's Roy Anika attended today's funeral and joins us now. You're the only one in the room that was actually there in the room. Tell us, take us there. What was it like? It was, it's hard to put into words what that was like. It was one of the most extraordinary hours of my life, I think. It was incredibly moving. It was solemn, but it was celebratory. I thought Justin Welby's sermon was wonderful on point sticking to sort of the importance of her faith. There were so many personal moments, seeing the little horseshoe brooch that Princess Charlotte was wearing, a gift from the Queen. It was incredibly moving. Uh, of course, seeing the whole, you know, royal family behind the coffin. Um, we were seated, we were incredibly lucky. We were very, very close to Her Majesty, um, very close to the catafalque. And so we had a, a clear view of it. And the congregation were just incredibly moved by the whole thing. It was an extraordinary occasion. So you had a very good look at the note. We were talking about the note that was on top of, of her coffin. Charles's note. Written by King Charles. Yes, which said, in, in loving and devoted memory, Charles R. Of course, we're all getting used to seeing that. And actually, the singing the national anthem at the end was incredibly rousing. It was very, very poignant. But everyone still is trying to get used to singing God Save the King. And just as the crowd was singing God Save the the king, the camera panned to the king's face, and you could see him well up. He looked ashen-faced through most of um, the funeral service. As is expected, he's lost his mother, but also it felt like, as he said when he addressed Parliament, he felt the weight of history. I, th I think that's absolutely right. You can see it there in his face now. This is a man who, for the last 10 or 11 days, has mourned publicly. He has barely had a moment in private to you know, we've seen him out and about on maneuvers going around the four corners of the United Kingdom. And we know that billions of people are watching this today. And of course, he has to put on this incredible, you know, strong front. But it must have been extraordinary for him to be you know, in the Abbey where he was for his mother's coronation and now at her funeral. Very Maria, moving. I've been thinking about the family a lot because whenever you lose a, a loved one that's very close to you, you do just want it to be over. You want to go through the, you want to have the ceremony and you want it to be over. And normally, it doesn't take 10 days. So I just think what it's like for them 10 days to have to grieve so publicly and still put on the face for everybody. What kind of toll do you think that's taking on all of them, really? I think it's taking an enormous toll on all of them. I mean, we have seen some, some great shows of unity and yes. united front from all of them, which has been fantastic. But I think you can't blame them if behind the scenes they're exhausted. And I think that's why we've got this huge, you know, committal service, which is going to be watched by everyone at Windsor. But I should think they are all absolutely desperate for that moment tonight, which is private, the private burial, where finally they can lay her and the Duke of Edinburgh to rest without anyone watching. And the no significance of Prince, Char uh, Prince George, who's nine, and Princess Charlotte, we all got a kick out of watching them. Why do you decided that, why do you think the parents decided that they would be included today? Well, my understanding from uh, Williams and Catherine's team is that that decision was made yesterday, um, but it was really up to whether the children felt they wanted to be there. And I know that William and Catherine have been speaking to them all week. There's been no pressure at all, despite the world wanting to see the symbolism of the future King George at his mother, his grand great grandmother's funeral, there was no pressure. It was a call they made personally. And did they attend um, Prince Philip's uh, funerals? 
Um, they did attend his memorial service, um, but they were that much younger then. That was a year and a half ago. And I think, you know, Charlotte is incredibly young. She's only seven years old. They were unbelievably poised. And again, I, she seems very poised. She's she Charlotte she does. just flipped Even admonishing, her. admonishing her brother from time. She's like she flicked her hair. She walked into the abbey. I, I saw, <laughs> composed herself was unbelievable walking in. She walked in the procession at the age of seven. She reminds me of the young queen. You remember yes. when Churchill yeah. first met the queen at the age of two, he commented on her extraordinary gravity and her poise. And I do feel somewhat the same about Princess Charlotte, you know, that she has got that same quality. Well, she has some good role models. She yes. has some excellent. <laughs> yes. And of course, Princess Anne is now going to become a huge influence yes, in this know, whole show. And there well, they are as they approach the Queen Victoria Memorial right in front of Buckingham Palace. Palace, and to see them in the car there with Queen Consort Camilla and the Princess of Wales on this procession. And I imagine we'll see some photos later of the crowd's reaction. But at one point, we saw people clapping yes. as the it's Queen's, a yes. you know, is a way I think that many people are thanking her for her incredible service. Let's that, talk about the Queen Consort Camilla because yeah. she certainly had a change of fortune. We were saying back in the day, she was considered very unpopular. People went so far to say, you know, home wrecker, you know, home breaker, but that she seems to be held in very good stead now with the public and I, with the family. I think she she is both, and I think that is years and years of hard graft, but it's also been years of people actually finally learning and, and coming to know what the real Camilla is like. What is she, what is the real Camilla? She's like? very warm and she's very fun and um, she She's fun? She is fun. Huge fun. Of all the members that Tina said tell you, huge fun. Of yeah. all the members of the Royal whenever I see her we chat about horses. Uh -huh. Um you know is this members of the the household paying their respect and right now in front it looks like Wesley, can you see that? I know there. Yeah. I know there are members. Well, they're members of pub, the public services. So you've got police, you've got nurses, you've got NHS. Um, so I, I, I think they're very much people that the Queen wanted to include in the procession. The Queen comes, but she's very fun. I'm struck she's by that. Fun. We don't know. We, we we know very little about her. In so case. she's she's great fun. She 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 will you know she'll wink at you. She'll I like that she's always got a glass of red wine in her hand on <laughs> on engagements in the evening. And she loves to smoke up the chimney. So she steals a little cigarette and smokes up the chimney. But I think Charles at the same smoke. At the same time, you've got to remember this is a woman who didn't want to be queen or think she was ever going to be queen, and perhaps that's something she had in common with our own late monarch yes. who, who was born not thinking she was going to be queen. Tina, what she does, does that like phrase to kick mean? Up, she does love to kick up with her family. You know, she keeps her own house, yes. Ray Mill House in Wiltshire. And it's interesting that she's maintained that house. That's the place she can go where she can just kick off her shoes, have her family around for raucous supper parties, you know, in the evening, and just be, you know, dispensed with all the stuff. Because, you know, if you're at Highgrove with Charles, you're never really alone. I mean, you know, she can go, she can be in her curlers and, you know, walking around and bang into some, you know, aid for Charles. And she loves to go to her own house and just not have to but deal does with the, any of that. Does the king go and stay at her house? Not really, not much. I mean, that's her place. That's her solace. She goes there with her family. And it's not that far from Highgrove, but it's, you yeah. know, she gets he, to escape So there. it's her own female cave. It's her own female <laughs> cave. <laughs> Every girl should have one. And she has over her, over her you know, her, 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 in her dining room, she has a big portrait of her grandmother, Alla, uh, you know, Mrs. Keppel, who was, in fact, the mistress of Edward the Edward the Seventh. So she has this... No, I just picture her, Tina, you know, with a glass of wine that you said, Roy, and uh, smoking a little cigarette, just saying, this feels pretty good. And with family. She loves with having her, her children, her two children, Laura and Tom, and, and her, I think she's got f uh, four or five grandchildren. She loves having them at Raymill House, as Tina said, because, I mean, she gave an interview where she said it's the only place, it's the one place she can be herself and be off duty. It's the Absolutely. one place where she doesn't have hordes of staff, um, and, and it's much less formal. It's not formal at all, Raymill. It's not yeah, like Highgrove, yes. which is full of Charles' staff. It's just where she can go and be herself, take well, off the crown. Well, well, her children, when you said children, I forgot. Of course she has children. Will they be incorporated into the royal family or royal duties? No. 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 So Laura and Tom both have a completely private life. They're incredibly close to the king, okay. um, but they will have no formal official roles at all. And last night, this release by the palace of this video of Camilla talking mm. about um, the queen in very personal terms. What was that meant to do? She wanted to really give her own sort of personal 
uh, memory of her, but she also made a, you know, a point that no one else has made, which is how much she respects and admires the Queen for being the only woman at mm. that time who was in this great sea of men, everything she did, a 25-year-old monarch. She was in this incredibly male monarchy, surrounded by men all the time, but she managed to carve her own way. I, which... I loved one of the anecdotes from that statement, um, the, the tribute last night that Camilla gave about the Queen was on her, she said on her wedding day or near her wedding day, she went to see the Queen and uh, was really nervous and, and left home with heels, one with a two inch heel, one with a four inch heel, <laughs> completely the wrong shoes. And the Queen spotted her hopping along and just started laughing and said, don't worry about it. And I just, I love that Camilla brought yes. the humor of the moment to attribute to the Queen. Yes. She had, she shared a lot of interest with the Queen. I mean, you know, Camilla's madly keen on horses, which the Queen was, so they shared that bond. And I'm sure that the Camilla will take over the Queen's role at Ascot when mm. she was the center point of that. And as we see uh, the Queen's, um, coffin as well as the gun carriage the entire procession approach buckingham palace i want to bring in mark phillips who is there mark we've we've seen him go around the front of buckingham palace really significant moment uh, in this whole day what we're witnessing here as they turn up constitutional hill and leave the palace behind is the transition the business transition the functional transition uh, of the monarchy from the queen to the king uh, and the different style that he that he might bring to this. She's got another half mile, three quarters of a mile or so to go within the confines of Royal London. At that point, she'll transfer into a hearse and be taken on that trip through West London and out toward uh, Windsor, where the family service will be held uh, and where she will be interred. But what we're really seeing here, you know, they say that this, this is a country with never without a sovereign. The the last heartbeat of the dying sovereign, the next heartbeat is of the, the living sovereign. The queen is dead. God save the king. That's exactly what happened 10 days ago. But the real transfer of the authority of the monarchy is what we're witnessing here. And in the symbolism of the queen passing Buckingham Palace, where the business of royalty is so often carried out, and now moving away from it leaving it for Charles and the Queen Consort to make of it up what they will. Yes. Okay, Harry, Holly. Uh, Mark Phillips, thank you very much. And I want to bring in Holly Williams to talk about more of the members of the royal family. We also saw um, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle today. That's right, Nora. And I think with the Queen's death, we've seen uh, two almost contradictory things happening with Harry and Meghan. On the first hand, on the one hand, the Queen's death has sort of highlighted their very divergent paths with Harry's close family members. So Prince Charles is now King Charles. Uh, he's now on the throne. Prince William is now the Prince of Wales, heir to the throne. Their roles are more important to the monarchy than they've ever been before. On the other hand, you have Harry and Meghan continuing to pursue their very different path, which is in California and their philanthropic and business interests. So their paths are more divergent than ever before. On the other hand, the Queen's death has brought family together and we've seen Harry and Meghan playing very prominent roles. I mean, they were at Buckingham Palace when the Queen's coffin arrived. Uh, they were in Westminster Hall when the, the Queen began her process of lying in state. Uh, they were here today and they, and they did that walkabout outside Windsor Castle with William and Kate, with, with, with look, which looked like a return to royal duties more than two years uh, after they left. So I think it's quite fitting in a way that the Queen's death uh, is perhaps the beginning of a mending of bridges uh, between Harry and Meghan and the rest of the family. Since Holly Williams, thank you. And want to bring in Lorna Olyuvi, who is the chair of the Royal Scottish Country Dance Society and was inside the funeral here at Westminster Abbey. And, and Lorna, how did you know the Queen? Well, the Queen was the patron of the Royal Scottish Country Dance Society. She first became patron when she was Princess Elizabeth. And then when she became Queen, we, she added the, the suffix, the prefix of Royal Scottish Country Dance Society. And she herself dances. I was gonna say, did you ever see her dance? I never personally saw her dance, uh, but we have video of her dancing at Balmoral Castle, which of course is where she sadly died. And but how did she do? She was wonderful. Mm -hmm. She has a real feel for the music and the dance. and. 
And where were you seated inside the Abbey? I was seated in the nave. And so I had a, a lovely view of everyone processing in. Oh, there's the Queen dancing. And yes, <laughs> I had a lovely view of everyone processing yeah. in and out. And, and the, the moving moments of the coffin going past as well. How did you think King Charles looked? He looked ashen faced to us. I, yes, it it's must have been a, a pretty awful week for him. I think he's handled it beautifully. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm very, very impressed at how smooth the changeover has been and just how, how much he has thought about the people as well as his own family. He seems to right now have a lot of goodwill with the people, don't you think? Yes, I, I fully agree. Uh, and I, I also think William, I think the monarch is in good hands. Yeah, I mean, Roy, uh, you know, the, the, the king has big, big shoes to fill because his mother is so beloved. And we were saying, do you think he feels tremendous pressure for that or do you think he's just ready? Both. I think I think they are impossible boots to fill. Nobody could fill them, and I think nobody expects him to. But at the same time, he has been the longest heir apparent in British history. He's had an unbelievably long time to think and prepare for how he wants to do this role. So, of course, there is enormous pressure on him. She is Elizabeth the Great. She was the greatest monarch of the modern age, perhaps of all time in British history. He knows he can't replicate that. He's not going to have the time to do it. And I think nobody will ever actually have the same affection with the British people all around the world that, Elizabeth, that the Queen did. But I think he will, he's, re he's ready. He's ready. What struck you most, Lorna, about the service today? I think it was the atmosphere in the Abbey and the, the, there seemed to me to be a perfect balance with it giving what individuals would want, whether they were Scottish, English, Irish, Welsh, whether they were from the Commonwealth or from around the world. And I think the balance also between the religious side and just making sure that we paid our duty, dutiful respect to Her Majesty for all that she'd done. I thought the words were beautiful as well as the music and the atmosphere I, I will never forget. And I, it was such a privilege and an honor to be there. It was quite a collection of yes. the world's most powerful in it there. It was. Uh, yes. and, and the fact that you were there as part of the Scottish Dance Society, I mean, the Queen seemed to have many interests. Yes. We always heard about the dogs and the horses. This is the first I've heard about Scottish dancing. Forgive my ignorance, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's traditional dance. It goes, it goes back a long, long time. And we, da we dance in sets of eight, so we, it's, it's the social dance, uh, the social unlike, dance. Unlike Highland dancing, which is more performance, it's a social dance. So our motto is fun, friendship, and fitness. So fun, you have to be fitness. pretty fit to be able to keep Laura, going. We should do that. <laughs> fun, friendship, and fitness. Have you done it, Roya? Uh, I fun, have, friendship, I, and fitness. I'm, I love all of those words. I'm not. I'm not au fait with Scottish dancing, but I'm willing to learn. Yes, and well, the, mu looks, the music does it. Is, that's and, it, right and there. With all due respect, it looks a little bit like what we call the do si do yes. back at home. But uh, Lorna, thank you so much. Yes. What a privilege. Oh, I love. That you, you came with visuals because I thought it was the Irish dance where they're dancing by themselves, <laughs> and I couldn't envision the Queen doing that. I can see very clearly yes. what she's doing there. Very Thank nice. You. To Thank you very much indeed for Thank having me. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you, you and for coming. I want to bring in Roxana Saberi, who is at Hyde Park with a grandfather and granddaughter who came to watch today's events. Roxana. Yeah, Nora, there's still tens of thousands of people in, here in Hyde Park watching the day's events on big screens, and you can hear some of it coming out of the speaker here. Some people came last night. They actually camped out since 7 p.m. I spoke to one family that did that, but many others came this morning, like Harry and his granddaughter, Ellen. Harry, why did you want to come with your granddaughter out here today? Well, I, I felt it was important to her to have the memory of the Queen. What kind of memories do you think you're, you're going to have? Well, mine are going to be short-lived, <laughs> <laughs> but um, wonderful ones, because, uh, you know, she's reigned for 70 years and uh, she's hardly barely put her foot wrong in that time, and that is some achievement. What do you make of all the people here? Wonderful, wonderful. I've been down to celebrate uh, Jubilee previously okay. in 2012 yeah. and I uh, didn't come to the, for the last one but uh, I wanted to come to this because it's a huge change mm. uh, with Charles having waited f for so long and now King, King Charles. Yes, now you have third. a new king. Ellen, why did you want to be here today? Um, I think because there won't be another queen for a long time so it's like a big moment because there's going to be kings for like the next three generations or something. 
So the queen was 96 and you're 12, you told me. Yeah. How could you relate to her? Um, well, she was really nice and she always cared about the public a lot and she did what was right for the country. What are you guys going to do next? You're going to watch the procession? Well, we were hoping to have got down on the mall this morning, but, but uh, that didn't happen because there's so many people here to celebrate and uh, to mourn the Queen. So we will now just take in the atmosphere wherever we end up. Thank you both, Harry okay. and Alan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. You. So these are just two of the tens of thousands of people who have been here at the park. Some are heading down to the procession, the funeral procession, which is just a few minutes walk from here. Back to you, Nora and Gail. Thank you, Roxana. We're going to go to Charlie Daggett. He's along the long walk at Windsor Castle where thousands have gathered. They are waiting for the Queen to come back to Windsor. I was told when we were there uh, a few years ago that this is one of her favorite places. And then I hear Balmoral is also her favorite place. <laughs> but you were there, Charlie. Tell us what's going on. Well, it's certainly her favorite weekend retreat and for the past couple of years since the pandemic struck. It has essentially been her primary residence, but yes, she'd rather be here than above the shop at Buckingham Palace. And what's been happening here this morning, tens of thousands of people have been gathering. They've been watching on these big screens. There's one of those every hundred yards or so leading all the way up to Windsor Castle itself. And when I say tens of thousands of people, it's hard to estimate exactly how many people are here because we're going to swing the camera around if we can all the way down to the beginning of the long walk 2.63 miles it's just been packed and there are more people arriving by the minute you can see them passing through security here and they're arriving from all over the country you've spoken to people who have been here overnight in order to get their positions to get the front row uh, but there are people that have come uh, from uh, north uh, northern england most of the people that we've spoken to here are actually from windsor and the reason that's important is because the queen would spend her time here every sunday she'd go to chapel so to them, it's like losing a neighbor as well as losing a queen. Prince Philip used to ride through here. So they would see the king and the queen, uh, excuse me, Prince Philip and the queen um, repeatedly through Windsor Great Park here. So there are a lot of people who feel like this personal connection. And, and what's poignant about this particular part of it, there will be the final, excuse me, the final ceremony here at Windsor at St. George's Chapel. But this will be the last time that they're able to see the Queen. This, and this is what makes it, it, it poignant, makes it powerful, it makes it real. Um, and it's a, a sort of shared sadness. When they were watching the service here, you could hear a pin drop. And it's just a sense of belonging here at Windsor Castle. As you point out, Charlie, that's where the procession will end up this afternoon. And for many people who don't know, describe Windsor and the Windsor estate because um, the the prince and princess of wales william and kate have just moved there to adelaide cottage right and soon or at some point they would move into the castle correct and harry and Meghan also live there too when they when they're in town they have a place frogmore which is very close to where uh, william and kate live yeah, well, that's exactly right. And of course, this has been a place where we've seen royal weddings. Charles and Camilla were married here. We, we were here, Gail, you were here um, when Harry and Meghan were married. So this is a place of great celebration and it's a home. Again, Mark Phillips has said it repeatedly that Buckingham Palace is, is kind of the office. This is the closest home outside of Buckingham Palace in London, and it's this huge, grand estate. There are 39 monarchs that have been inside this castle. It is the longest uh, castle that has, that has hosted royal families in the nation, and for a place that's steeped in history like that, that says a lot about Windsor Castle. So it's a place that's very close to the Queen's heart, very close to uh, William and Kate, as you mentioned, and also Harry and Meghan. And it, it, we, we talk about this, Windsor Great Park. This is just a tiny fraction of it. So behind that is where you have Frogmore Cottage and other residences. And it's a place where, you know, the royalty has been able to, in a weird way, get away. You know, it's the place out of town. So it's within reach of London, but it's also a place where they have privacy. They don't have to be on, you know, parade. 
We've heard uh, we've heard several announcements like that. So they're they're telling people not to throw flowers as the procession passes. Oh. They've also mm. been trying to encourage people to move down from the castle itself and move down closer to the front so they can sort of spread out the crowds. But as I as I told you, I mean these crowds have been gathering Charlie. and gathering in number throughout the day. Charlie Daggett, thank you outside Windsor Castle. Nor I think it's too late to tell people not to not to bring flowers or throw flowers because that's their way of showing their love and respect for her. Yeah, and then as we mentioned, they will process there after going through Wellington Arch, which is what you see right now. And Charlie brought up Harry and Meghan and Roy and Nika is here with us. You've done a lot of reporting this weekend. There has been a lot of focus on the two of them. There has been, and um, I did write a lot about it uh, at the weekend for the paper. I was pretty plugged into uh, what's going on, um, and it's been difficult. Uh, I don't think anyone's trying to pretend it hasn't. We have seen, what's great is we have seen shows of unity from the whole family and from both brothers for the last 10 and days. And on both sides, wouldn't you on, say? On both sides, absolutely. I think Harry and Meghan have done everything that's been asked of them. Um, and, you know, it's been good to see both of them actually embrace sort of in, in the royal fold. But it, it hasn't been easy. I, I know, you know, at the weekend, that grandchildren's vigil um, with the Queen, I know Harry felt very sad that the, his grandmother's initials had been removed from his uniform. That was tough for him. He didn't expect that. Why um, were they removed? It's a good question. It's yeah. still not entirely. I mean, there are there are military. There are a lot of military protocol. There, there is military protocol, but the, the commander in chief, the king, can also make exceptions. Make to the exceptions. Rules. Yeah. Let's bring back in Wesley Kurz with us because the significance of what's happening right now, and there we see again Prince George second in line to the throne, and Princess Charlotte third in line, along with the Queen Consort. And we're now about to come to the last formal moment of the procession in Royal London. So, so this is the, the Wellington Arch, which was, is kind of the entrance to the court. We saw horse guards at the other end of the park. And now those that, your viewers that know London well will know we're approaching Hyde Park. We're at Hyde Park Corner. And once upon a time, for much of the rain, it was a private area. But there you see the members of the family.